Rothschild was born in 1908 into the famous banking family. She grew up on her father's estate at Ashton Wold in Northamptonshire. Her uncle Walter was a brilliant eccentric, a great collector, and the only man ever successfully to harness wild zebras. Her father Charles was a banker and keen amateur naturalist who discovered how fleas carry plague. Miriam herself was never sent to school, but she became an outstanding naturalist and a world authority on the flea and other parasites. One of the few women scientists to be elected to the Royal Society, Dr Rothschild also invented the car seat belt and fought to legalise homosexuality. Among her seven wonders of the world, she includes the jump of the flea, dawn on the Jungfrau mountain and a very peculiar parasitic worm. From the very first, for instance, I was only interested in things that were alive. I was not remotely interested in ordinary toys. And I asked, as a, they said, what do you want as a Christmas present? And I said, some baby chickens. And when they were given to me, they were velvet models. And I just screamed my head off. And my father, who was very understanding, immediately gave me some live white mice, and then that was all perfect. I just liked live, live animals. And the, my first real pet was a quail, a live quail. I was not interested in dolls ever. And natural history was the thing I liked from the start. Look, um, do you see this moth? It's a garden tiger moth. It's one, absolutely one of my favourite moths. There's a very amusing story attached to this moth because it has mites which live in its ears. And that's absolutely incredible. First of all, the, the moth's ear, this, this tiger moth ear, is a very small hole. But the, these mites always find the ear. Now, we don't really know how they find the ears of tiger moths because in an usual way, these mites, when they attack moths, sit on the top of flowers, waiting, with their, with their little legs sticking out, and they wait for the moths to arrive to feed on the flowers. When the moths put their long tongues into the flowers, the mites scramble up the tongues, that gets them onto the head of the moth, and then they invariably find their way into one of the ears. The tiger moth hasn't got a long tongue because when it comes out, it never feeds. It had all its food at the caterpillar stage, and it just comes out to breed. So it's not really known, at least I don't know, how these mites get into their ears. But to say it's the same story. Once the mites are in the ear, one mite gets in, other mites follow, but they always go into the same ear. The moths never have both ears filled with mites. And you see these mites fighting one another and copulating with one another and stuff, always in one ear. And nobody understood this. Nobody knew why they only go into one ear. This seemed very odd. I had the idea, possibly, why this was so, because you see, these moths fly at night and they're caught by bats. And you know those lovely little squeaks that you only hear when you're under 10 years old or something? You know you're going deaf when you can't hear bats. But these moths uh, avoid them by clearing out of the way when they hear these supersonic sounds, because they can hear the supersonic sound. And it struck me that, of course, if they had mites in both ears, they wouldn't be able to get out of the way. And so it's very important they should only have them in one ear. When the mites get on the moth, they walk along, they get onto the head, go into an ear, they leave a trail so that other mites following only go into one ear. Because obviously the mites don't want to get eaten by bats either. 
So this is a protective device. And it's a very, I think it's a very amusing one. And that, that's the story of mites in the ears of these moths. I'm absolutely convinced that naturalists are born and not made. I had brothers and sisters, and some went into science, and some went into art, and so forth. There were no naturalists among them, but we were all brought up the same way. And here at Ashton, where I was born, natural history and conservation wasn't a subject. It was just part of everyday life. I came up here one afternoon, and to my amazement, there was an uninvited visitor who stripped completely and plunged into the bluebells as if they were a sea. <laughs> and I said to her, there's a lot of brambles in there, do be careful, but she didn't seem to mind. <laughs> my father had no ambitions at all for me, and nobody had any ambitions for me intellectually. I was rather amused because I found a letter only about last year that my, among some old papers that my father had written to me from Switzerland and I could tell by the date I was nine years old. And in this letter he said, will you please tell me how you knew that crisis igniter was a parasite? I was obviously quite... <laughs> Or is sort of well into things, well into natural history by the time I was nine years old. This is a chrysalis, a live chrysalis of the monarch butterfly. Very, very pretty little thing. Bright green with a golden diadem. 